If you're new to Wii or GameCube emulation on Android, Dolphin and its many versions can be quite daunting, but I am going to endeavor to show you everything that you need to know to get the most performance possible out of your hardware. This is an extremely detailed guide, and there will be timestamps below to help you reference the content that you need. I hope that after watching this video, you will be able to configure this emulator in the same way that I would if I had your device. If you enjoy this content, please consider leaving a like or subbing to the channel to support my work. Let's first go over some of the requirements for this guide. As an emulator, Dolphin supports a wide range of Android devices, but to be able to play the most games possible, you will need a fairly powerful flagship phone or device from the last four years or so. Older hardware can still use this emulator, as you will see in this guide, but you will need to do a lot more tinkering, whereas a current flagship device will give you an almost plug-and-play experience. For this guide, I am going to have a bare minimum spec that you should have to realistically get games to run. To simplify things, you just need to make sure that you have a processor with at least a Cortex-A72. This is the equivalent CPU performance that you would get in something like a Raspberry Pi 4. The GPU that you have also matters, but I found that as long as you have something with these Cortex-A70 cores, you should be fine. Now not everyone knows what Cortex cores they're using, so I will give you a simple way to find out so you don't waste your time trying this emulator if you don't have the correct device. All you need to do is head over to the App Store and download ADA64. Once you do that, head over to the CPU section and you should see your cores listed under Architecture. Some manufacturers use custom Cortex IP in their processors, so you might see a different name listed here. On this Snapdragon tablet, for example, it says that I have a Cairo 265 Gold. Entering that into Google tells me that this is based on a Cortex-A73, so this is good enough for this guide. Generally speaking, you will have a smoother experience with Snapdragon processors that meet these minimum requirements than you will with other processors. The next requirement isn't a hard requirement, but you should consider getting a Bluetooth controller or a USB controller to use with this emulator, especially if you plan to play Wii games. This emulator supports touch controls, however, the experience is not great. The controller that you use does not matter, and you should look to just use hardware that you already have lying around, versus going out and buying something new. If you are on a budget, iPega controllers can be picked up from Amazon for around $40 or less. Quality is not the best at this price point, but something like the PG9167 is a decent option. If you want something better and you have a bigger budget, you could go with a Kishi 2 or something like a GameSir X2. If you want to get the best value possible, I would consider buying a used Xbox One wireless controller and a phone holder. This is the controller that I will use for this guide since it's the most widely available. It would also be nice to have a device with an SD card slot, but that is not a hard requirement. It goes without saying that you also need to supply your own ROMs to use this emulator. There are legal ways to do this if you own a modded Wii, and I'll put a link to a wiki that goes over what you need to dump your own games. I will not be going over where you can download games, but I will say that the most common file types that you will see for ROMs for this emulator are ISO, GCC, or WBFS. One of the most annoying aspects of using this emulator is the sheer volume of versions that are available and how time-consuming it can be to find out which one has the best performance. Generally speaking, the official build of Dolphin will give you the best compatibility since it is regularly updated with fixes for games, but it is more difficult to test out which options are the best for each game, and the performance is worse than the forked versions. If you have something comparable to a Snapdragon AAA processor, you can just use the official version without worrying too much about any lost potential. If you have something weaker, the forked versions are almost always going to be the best option. The four main versions for this emulator are as follows. Official Dolphin Emulator, Dolphin MMJ, Dolphin MMJR1, and Dolphin MMJR2. Dolphin MMJ has been superseded by Dolphin MMJR1, so we will only focus on the other three. This is where things can get kind of annoying. You need to do a bit of trial and error to find out which of these three can give you the best performance possible as early as possible so you do not waste any time. This entire process should take you about 10 minutes or so using my method. Let's start that now. Our first step is to head over to the official Dolphin Emulator website and download the latest development build for Android. You can download this APK file on your PC and transfer it to your device over USB, or you can just do the entire process on your Android device itself. That is the easiest way. Download the APK file and make sure to install it once it is done. After that, head over to the GitHub link that I have down in the description box below and download and install Dolphin MMJR. Once that's done, head over to the second GitHub link and download and install Dolphin MMJR2.
If you followed these steps correctly, you should have these three apps installed on your device. The next part will require us to have a game to test across these three versions. You can use anything for this, but I'm going to suggest three that all have the same benefit. That benefit is that they do not have long intros that cannot be skipped, and you can get into the game in under one minute. My top choice for this would be Luigi's Mansion, because it is a very small file at around 200 megabytes. Besides this, you can use Twilight Princess or Resident Evil 4. All three are good options, and I will do my demonstrations with Luigi's Mansion. After you pick whatever ROM you want to use, you need to make a new folder in your internal storage or on your SD card. I am going to make a folder called ROMs, and I will make a second folder inside that called GC for GameCube. Inside that folder, I will add my test ROM. With one of these ROMs in hand, let's start by opening up the Dolphin app with the blue and white logo. When you open the app, you will see a prompt and you can select yes or no depending on your preference. In the bottom corner, you will see a plus sign. Click that and then navigate over to the folder that we just created. Once you are there, select use this folder and then allow in the pop-up. If you are connected to the internet, you should see the ROM was added and it should have box art. We will come back to a lot of this, but we need to do the bare minimum right now just to collect some data. Click the gear icon at the top of the app and then go to config. In the menu that comes up, click on general and then enable the save state option at the bottom. Back out to the main settings screen again and this time go into graphic settings. Here, select the show FPS option. Now we are ready to start testing. I'm going to open up Luigi's Mansion and get to the point where I can control the character. You'll see that we have on-screen controls, but we will remove those later in this guide. The game is loaded to the point where I can control Luigi, so I will now make a save state to make testing easier. Swipe over from the left or press the back button and you should see a menu on the left side that allows you to create a quick save. Select that option. After you do that, you need to take note of a few things. First, write down the FPS that you see in the top right of your screen. In this case, I am floating at around 30 FPS or so, which is the native FPS for this game. You also need to take note of any graphical issues that you are seeing. In this case, Luigi's mouth is a bit glitchy, but everything else seems fine. Now we need to close this game and change one option. Click the gear icon again and go into graphic settings. At the top, change OpenGL to Vulkan and repeat the same test. There is a back-end multi-threading option that goes with Vulkan, but it rarely improves performance from my experience, so we can skip it for now. Once the game is booted, swipe from the left or press your back button and select Quick Load. As you can see, our FPS is much worse now with an average of under 20 or so. Now we generally know that OpenGL is the best option for this emulator. What we still need to find out is how high we can scale the rendering resolution before we cannot get a full 30 FPS. This will be useful when we're comparing the performance across the three emulators. I am going to close the game now and I will change the video backend back to OpenGL. After that, head over to Enhancements and select Internal Resolution. Increase the resolution from 1x to 2x and then repeat the test. Once I'm back in the game, I can see that my FPS is around 25 now, which is a bit slower than full speed. If I still had 30 FPS at this point, I would need to increase the rendering resolution to 3x or 4x until I could not maintain 30 FPS. Now that we have our testing data, we can continue with our other emulators. Our next emulator will be MMJR. Open the emulator and accept the permissions window that pops up. You will be asked to allow it to check for updates, and you can go ahead and hit cancel. At the top of the screen, hit the plus sign, and add that same GameCube directory that we made earlier. We are now ready to test that game again. Open Luigi's Mansion and get to the same point that you saved in the official emulator. Once the game is loaded, swipe over from the left to back out once to show the top menu and then click the folder icon. In the save state menu, click save. Looking at the reading on the screen, I can see the game is running at 30 FPS. Let's back out and change our back end. Select the gear icon and then go into graphic settings. Here, change the video back end to Vulkan and repeat the test. Looking at the data now, I am only getting an average of about 13 FPS. There is a bit more to this because it is possible to get Vulkan to run at 30 FPS, but it's pointless to go over that for what we're doing now. 
Let's close out of the game and change the backend back to OpenGL. After we do that, back out one screen and go into Enhancements. Once here, go to Internal Resolution. One cool thing about this fork is that it supports fractional resolutions. I went over why this is important in my last EtherSX2 video, but this is generally beneficial when it allows you to increase rendering resolution to a half increment when you cannot achieve full speed performance at a full 1x increase. As you recall, I cannot get this game to run at 2x native using the official emulator. If that was still true with this emulator, I could go to 1.5x native, which would run full speed, and it would look better than 1x. For now, let's see if 2x can work. After loading up the game, I can see that we now have an average of 29 FPS. So far, this emulator is giving the best performance. Let's test the final version, just to make sure. This time, open up the purple and black MMJR2 emulator. Accept the same permissions window again, and add our GameCube directory by clicking the plus sign in the bottom corner. Once you've done that, boot up the game. When the game is loaded, swipe over from the left to back out or press your back button and select the quick save option. Record the FPS that you are seeing on screen and any graphical issues. In this case, the game is running full speed and the same glitches that are present in the official emulator are present here. I will now close the emulator and change the video backend to Vulkan to confirm what we can already guess. Click the gear icon, then go to graphics and change the option to Vulkan. Start the game again and load up the save state. Now unlike the official emulator, Vulkan is running at full speed based on the FPS reading. You'll see that it states that it's running at 100% speed, but we can ignore that for now because this has options enabled that aren't enabled by default in the other two emulators that we just tested. The only thing left to do now is to find out if we can run this at 2x native with OpenGL. After changing the backend back to OpenGL and the rendering resolution to 2x, I am only able to get an average of 25 FPS. So, after doing these tests on my device, MMJR1 ended up being the best option, with the official emulator and MMJR2 being about equal. There are situations where this can be entirely different, and I have many devices where MMJR1 is very bad and MMJR2 is the best. If you followed this section correctly, congratulations. You now know which version is the best for your hardware. I don't know which one ended up being the best for you, so I will now go over each of these one by one. There are sections for this video labeled with the names of these three emulators, so you can skip to this section for the emulator that you need to configure. Let's start with the MMJR1 emulator. So far, we've added our GameCube game directory to this emulator, but we also need to add our Wii games. Make a new folder inside your ROMs directory on your device and copy over the games that you want to use. After you do that, click the plus sign at the top and navigate to the Wii folder to add your games. After doing that, you will be able to access your Wii games with the menu on the bottom. If you end up adding more games in the future that do not show up in this list, open the menu in the top right corner and select Refresh Library. For now, we are going to configure our controller. Head into GameCube input inside that same menu. Once here, go to GameCube Controller 1 and press Emulated and start mapping your controller. I'm using an Xbox controller, which uses an opposite button layout compared to Nintendo. You can map these buttons based on the values printed on your controller, or you can map them based on how they would be if your controller used a Nintendo layout. This would mean that the A button on my controller will be the B button in the emulator. Go through and map everything here. When you get to the triggers, everything here will be mapped to L2 and R2. Once you've done all of that, hit save in the top corner. Now we are going to configure the Wii controller. Open the right menu on the side again, and open Wii Input. Configuring a Wiimote can be daunting at first, but you can get most of the actions that you need with a general controller profile. You always have the option of making a per game one if you need. First off, set the extension to Nunchuck and start configuring the buttons. I have C set to L1 and Z set to L2. For the stick, map all of these to your left analog. Once you've done that, back out to the main input settings. It doesn't matter that much how you map these since the Wiimote is non-standard. I am going to map A to A, B to B, 1 to X, and 2 to Y. Map plus and minus to start and select on your controller and then map the IR to your right analog. Skip down a bit more until you get to shake. Map X, Y, and Z to R2. Then map your D-pad buttons and click save at the top. Now that we've done that, I am going to show you what shake does. In Super Mario Galaxy 2, 
You can see that my R2 now allows me to perform the spin move. In Donkey Kong Country Returns, it makes DK smack the floor and causes him to roll while you are moving. Let's go back to the main window now. In here, click the gear icon and then go into graphic settings. Make sure your video backend is set to the option that you tested to work the best for your device. Under where it says aspect ratio, you have a few options available to you. The device that I have is widescreen, and I want to play my games by using as much of this screen as possible. I am going to use the 4 x 9 option from this list, and then I will back out one screen. In here, go into Enhancements, and then go into Internal Resolution. Set this to the highest resolution that you could use in your testing game, while still maintaining a solid 30 FPS. If that is over 1x native, this will give you a better baseline to work with as you play and test more games. At the bottom of this screen, you will see that there is a widescreen hack option. Select this if you want to use widescreen hacks. If you do not, leave this unchecked and you can set the aspect ratio to auto in the previous menu. Now you are ready to save the settings. Load up your test game again and open up the top menu by swiping from the left or pressing the back button once. Open the menu in the top right hand corner and select toggle controls. In this screen, select toggle all. If you've done everything correctly so far, you should be able to move Luigi with your controller. Open the top menu again and this time press the processor icon. In this config menu, you should see several options already have check marks. Some of these games will not have all of these checked because they can cause issues. In those games, these options also tend to give you a huge performance boost. If for whatever reason you are having trouble playing these games at even 1x native resolution, you can use the immediately present XFB option and you can uncheck sync on skip idle. If you are not quite at 100% speed, Turning off Sync on Skip Idle option will improve the speed of the audio and make it less annoying to play slow games. In this particular game, we are using OpenGL because it allowed me to play this game at 2x native, while Vulkan was significantly worse. We do have some graphical issues in this game using OpenGL, but I want you to pretend like we had more significant issues using OpenGL that we do not see when we use Vulkan. In this case, we might want to bump down the internal resolution and switch over to that video backend only for this game. Let me show you how to do that now. Close out of the emulation and hold your finger down on the game title. In the menu that pops up, select Game Settings. Once you are here, you can change the video backend from the default option that you selected from your testing and override it only for this game. In my case, that means I will run Luigi's Mansion with Vulcan. I also need to change the internal resolution from 2x. Even though 1x didn't work from my testing, 1.5x can work with the XFB option turned on. I'll change that to 1.5x, and you can see the game runs at 30 FPS. If I turn off that XFB option, the FPS drops significantly. As I mentioned, some games do not have all of these config checkboxes enabled by default due to the issues in the game. I want to show you one popular example. Here is the intro sequence of Wind Waker at 2x native resolution. As you can see, it is running very poorly. When we open the config menu, we can see several options are turned off. If we open the menu and turn them on again, we can close the game and reboot it with those settings already applied. As you can see, the speed greatly improves. If you ever need to revert some change, you can use the delete settings option in the per game settings window to bring things back to your global settings. The final thing that I want to talk about for this emulator is the IR sensitivity. Using the default settings, you will find that some Wii games do not perform as they should. One example of this is Skyward Sword. As you can see in the intro menu, I do not have full range of motion over the joystick that is on screen. We can fix this by adjusting the total pitch and total yaw under the floating config menu. Increase those values until you have full range of motion on this screen. That's about everything that you need to know for MMJR1, except for a few other things that we'll talk about later in this guide. In this section, we will go over the official Dolphin emulator. If this emulator ended up giving you the best performance, you probably have a fairly powerful device. So far, we've added our GameCube game directory to this emulator, but we also need to add our Wii games. Make a new folder inside your ROMs directory on your device and copy over the games that you want to use. After you do that, Click the plus sign at the bottom of the screen and navigate to your Wii folder to add your games. After doing that, you will be able to access your Wii games with the menu on the top. If you end up adding more games in the future that do not show up in this list, you can use the reload option at the top. 
For now, we are going to configure our controller. Click the gear icon at the top of the screen and select GameCube input. Once here, go to GameCube controller one, press emulated, and then start mapping your controller. I am using an Xbox controller, which uses an opposite button layout compared to Nintendo. You can map the buttons based on the values printed on your controller, or you can map them based on how they would be if the controller used a Nintendo layout. This would mean that the A button on my controller will be the B button in the emulator. Go through and map everything here. When you get to the triggers, map all of them to L2 and R2. When you are done, back out two times and go into Wii input. Select Wii Remote 1 and then Emulated to get started. Configuring a Wiimote can be daunting at first, but you can get most of the actions that you need with a general controller profile. You always have the option of making a per game one in the future if you need. First off, set your extension to Nunchuck and start configuring the buttons. I have C set to L1 and Z set to L2. For the stick, map all of these to your left analog. Once you've done that, back out to the main input settings. It doesn't matter that much how you map these since the Wiimote is non-standard. I'm going to map A to A, B to B, 1 to X, and 2 to Y. Map plus and minus to the start and select buttons on your controller, and then map the IR to your right analog. Skip down a bit more until you get to shake. Map X, Y, and Z to R2. Then map your D-pad buttons and back all the way out to save your settings. You will now be able to perform motion controls like the Spin Move in Super Mario Galaxy and the Roll and Smash in Donkey Kong Country Returns. The official Dolphin emulator is the most annoying out of the three to use because you do not have quick access to those hack settings like you do in MMJR1. This means trial and error testing is a lot more time consuming. You have two ways to handle this. You could enable all of the hacks in the global profile so they apply by default to any game you play or you could tweak them on a game by game basis to find out which options improve performance the most when you find yourself unable to hit full speed FPS. It's up to you, but I'm going to change the global profile. Click the gear icon and then click graphic settings. The video backend that you see should be the one that gave you the best performance on your device. On this 8 plus gen 1 phone, there is very little difference between OpenGL and Vulkan. Scroll down from here and go into Enhancements. Select the highest internal resolution from the list that you tested to work well in your test ROM. After you do that, scroll to the bottom and turn on the widescreen hack option if you want your games to fill out your screen. I do, so I will select that option. Back out one screen and change the aspect ratio from auto to 416 by 9 if you turned on the widescreen hack. Now, go to Hacks. As I said, I want the global profile for this emulator to be the one that will give me the best performance possible without needing to do any tweaks, so I'm going to enable a few options here. Put a check in Skip EFB Access and put a check in Immediately Present XFB. Once you've done that, back out until you're back in the main settings menu. Once here, select Config and then go to Advanced. Here, there is an option called Synchronize GPU Thread. By default, this is set to On Idle Skipping. Depending on your device, it can be advantageous to use the never option. In some cases, I've seen FPS improvements that are upwards of 25%, but it can make your games more prone to crashes, so if you use it, make sure to make frequent saves. This device doesn't need that option, so I will leave it on the default setting. The only thing left for us to do is to remove our on-screen controls. Load up a game and then back out once so you can see the left menu. Scroll down to Overlay Controls and click Toggle Controls. Select the toggle all option to clear your screen. Now, even though this menu is a bit limited compared to MMJR1, we still have access to some useful things. We have our save and load state options, but we also have a settings option. If we pick that, we will be in a stripped down menu with some options that cannot be changed. The useful things that you can change here that you probably will end up using are the aforementioned hacks and the internal resolution scaling options. In this game, I have it set to 4X native, which is a bit too much for this title. I can go into the enhancement section and change this to 3X without needing to close the game. You can use the same process to enable or disable other options while the game is running. The problem is that it will save those changes as a global profile. I would need to revert those changes and then go into the per game settings window that I can find by holding my finger down on a title and then making the changes there. The final tip that I wanna go over is the IR sensor. In some Wii games, you need to have a significantly larger range of motion for the IR controls that we set than you will have by default. Skyward Sword's intro menus are one such example. As you can see, I can't quite access the entire screen. One good thing about this emulator is that it also maps touch inputs as IR inputs. 
For both situations, we still need to increase the sensitivity. Open up the left menu by pressing the back button or swiping from the left side once. Go down to overlay controls and then go to touch IR pointer and change the sensitivity. In my case, I needed to set the yaw to 65 and the pitch to 75 to get good touch controls. If you make any per game configurations for the games that you're playing that you want to later revert, the easiest way to do that is to hold your finger down on the game and then go to the clear game settings and cheats option. This will bring you back to the global profile for that game. There are a few other things you can do with the simulator that we will cover in a later bonus section in this video. In this section, we will go over the Dolphin MMJR2 emulator. Out of the two MMJR versions, this is the one that is closest to the official emulator. Most of the menus are the same, but we do have a lot of quality of life improvements that make this one the better option out of the two, if you are going to need to do a lot of tweaking on a game by game basis. So far, we've added our GameCube game directory to this emulator, but we also need to add our Wii games. Make a new folder inside your ROMs directory on your device and copy over the games that you want to use. After you do that, click the plus at the bottom of the screen and navigate to the Wii folder to add your games. After doing that, you will be able to access your Wii games with the menu on the top. If you end up adding more games in the future that do not show up in this list, you can use the reload option at the top. For now, we are going to configure our controller. Click the gamepad icon at the top of the screen and select GameCube Controller 1. Press Emulated and then start mapping your controller. I am using an Xbox controller which does not use the same layout as Nintendo. You can map the buttons based on the values printed on your controller, or you can map them based on how they would be if the controller used a Nintendo layout. This would mean that the A button on my controller will be the B button in the emulator. Go through and map everything here. When you get to the triggers, map both L buttons to L2 and both R buttons to R2. When you are done, back out two times and click the Wiimote icon. Select Wii Remote 1 and then Emulated to get started. Configuring a Wiimote on a controller without sensors can be a bit annoying, but you can get most of the actions that you need with a general controller profile. You always have the option of making a per game one if you need in the future. First off, set your extension to Nunchuck and start configuring the buttons. I have C set to L1 and Z set to L2. For the stick, map all of these to your left analog. Once you've done that, back out to the main input settings. It doesn't matter that much how you map these since the Wiimote is non-standard. I'm going to map A to A, B to B, 1 to X, and 2 to Y. Map plus and minus to the start and select buttons on your controller, and then map the IR to your right analog. Skip down a bit more until you get to shake. Map X, Y, and Z to R2. Then map your D-pad buttons and back all the way out to save the settings. You will now be able to perform motion controls like the spin move in Super Mario Galaxy and the roll and smash in Donkey Kong Country Returns. Just like MMJR1, this emulator is very easy to configure and it is pretty much ready to go at this point. There are just a few things that we need to check on. Click the gear icon and then go into graphics. If you did the test at the beginning of this guide, your video backend should be set to the best one for your device. In my case, it is OpenGL. If you have a widescreen device and you want to render the games that you're playing in 16x9, go down to the aspect ratio option and change it to force 16x9. After that, head into enhancements. Make sure that you set your internal resolution to the highest one that you were able to run without issues during your testing. Just remember that unlike the official emulator, this one supports fractional resolutions, so it should give you the best mix of visual and actual performance for your device. Once you're done with that, scroll down to the bottom and enable the widescreen hack option if you decided to have your games rendered in widescreen. If not, leave this unchecked. Then, back out to the main settings menu. If for whatever reason you do not like the default color scheme for this emulator, you can change the theme by going into the interface menu and changing the theme to something else. In my case, I'm going to change it to Dolphin Blue. Head back out to the settings menu again, and this time go to general. Scroll down and you should see an option called sync GPU on skip idle hack. By default, this will have a check, but there are cases where unchecking this can significantly improve your FPS at the cost of making the games less stable. If you are having issues getting a game to run well at 1x native resolution, you can experiment with this setting turned off. Just be aware that you need to make frequent saves of your games because they are easier to crash. That being said, I have seen FPS improvements that are upwards of 25% having this off on weaker devices. Let's continue. Load up your testing game again and open up the left side menu by going back. 
In here, select Overlay Controls and then go to Toggle Controls. Select the Toggle All option to remove all of the controls from your screen. You should find that you are now able to control the game with your controller. Our left menu is very similar to the one in the official Dolphin emulator, but we have one big addition, and that is the Quick Settings menu. If you open up this menu, you have easy access to four of the big performance hacks that are available, but you can also change the internal resolution. Hopefully, while you were testing your device, you were able to get your test ROMs to run at over 1x native resolution. If that is the case, you can set that resolution as your global profile. If you get into a situation where a more demanding game cannot run at that higher resolution, this setting allows you to easily test which rendering resolution you can support. Let's say that I have my global profile set to 2x, but I am playing a game that does not run full speed at that resolution. I can test which resolution is stable in a few seconds using this menu. Now this next part is a bit convoluted, but you have to set that slider back to how it is in your global profile after you are done testing. Once you've done that, close the game and you will be back in the main emulator menu. Once here, hold your finger down on the game that you just tested and click Custom Game Settings. Go to Graphic Enhancements and change the internal resolution to the one that is listed under your global profile setting. In my case, I am going to select 1.5x. Back all the way out to save your per game settings for this game. After you boot up the game again, it will override your global internal resolution setting with the one that you just set. This value could be higher than your global profile or lower. If you do not follow these steps exactly, you will end up modifying your global profile, which is not something that you want to do if your goal is eventually to have all of your games properly configured with the best resolution possible for each title. The only other point to mention for this emulator is Wii Motion Controls. These are the same as they are in the official emulator, so I will link the timestamp for that section on the screen now so you can find the relevant details. Now that you've gone through this much of the video, you now know most of the important things about this emulator and how to get the most performance out of it, but there are some advanced things left that we can do to improve game performance or add things to games. The first thing that I want to talk about in this bonus section is emulated CPU clock speed. This is something that we did not go over during the main emulator guide sections because it is something that you only need to mess with if you have fairly weak hardware or you are playing a very demanding game. I am going to show you how to do this in one game so you will know how to do this on your own in the future if you ever need to. The process is a bit different depending on the emulator that you are using. I am going to demonstrate this with MMJR1 since it is the easiest of the three to use with this option because we can see the changes in real time. My test game is Skyward Sword and I am running this on a Snapdragon 680 which is not powerful enough to run this game that well at 1x native resolution. We are pretty close, but we have a lot of issues that we cannot fix with the dedicated options that are available in this emulator. If you have followed the guide to this point and you are in a situation like this, your final option is to mess with CPU controls. Not every game works well with this option, but it can make games fully playable in situations where it does work. To get started, I am going to open the floating config menu and then I am going to enable the override emulated CPU clock speed option. After you do this, it is trial and error, and every processor in game responds differently to this. Generally speaking, you are going to be going under 100% to improve performance. Your goal should be to get the highest FPS possible, while also getting the audio to be perfect. In my example, this game only runs at around 28 FPS out of 30. You can start by dropping the percentage in 10 or 15% increments until the game does not have any audio issues. Based on my test with this game, I was able to get the audio to run almost flawlessly, with a 65% value. This gave me an average of 25 FPS. The game will run a bit slower than normal, but it is a good compromise if your hardware isn't quite up to the task. To do this in MMJR2, we need to boot up the game and then open the left menu. Once there, hit quick settings and then click on the icon in the corner. Now we need to go into general and then scroll down. Enable override emulated CPU clock speed and then start the process of testing the values like we just did. Just be aware that whatever you do inside this config menu while you are playing a game will change your global profile. You need to revert anything that you do after you find out what works best and then make the changes to the per game configurations as I showed earlier in this video. The official emulator also works in this way with the same need to make a per game configuration. The way to get to this option is a bit different, so I will show that now. In the game menu, open up the left menu and then go to settings. Go to config and then advanced. Turn on override emulated CPU clock speed and then start testing your emulated clock speed settings. 
Once you find the correct value, reset the changes that you made and close the game. Hold your finger on the game and select Edit Game Settings. Then enter the values that you tested. The only game that I've seen that improves when you go over 100% is F-Zero GX. If you are playing that game, set the CPU to 300% and see if it runs better. This next point does not improve performance at all from the test that I've done, but it is worth mentioning because it is easy to use. All of the emulators in this guide have cheat support and I want to quickly show how to use them. In MMJR1 and MMJR2, simply hold your finger down on a game that you want to activate cheat codes for. On the screen that pops up, click the download icon in the corner. If there are cheats available for your game, they should be populated in this list. To use the codes, just put a check in the box. From my experience, not every code that is added in this way can work. After you've added the codes that you want, back out and go into the settings menu and then go into general. Select the enabled cheats option and then your code should work. In this example, I enabled invincibility, increased movement speed, and infinite ammo. In the official Dolphin emulator, hold your finger down on the game and go down to edit cheats. This will tell you that the cheat system is disabled, so click on the first option to enable the cheats and then go back to this cheats menu. Scroll down and select download gecko codes. After you do that, enable the codes that you want to use. Anyway, I hope this guide helps you in getting started with GameCube and Wii emulation on Android. This was a lot of work to put together, so a like or a sub would be greatly appreciated. If you have any questions, leave those down below. Happy gaming everyone, talk you out.